OK. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Marine and I uh, are happy to uh, to have you at this uh, Art in Conversation seminar. Today's session is dedicated to learning from fiction. As usual, we invited two experts that have different backgrounds to share their point of view on the same topic. After the two talks, we will open the discussion and everyone will have a chance to ask a question or share a comment. You can either type your question or chat in the chat or raise your virtual hand and we will give you the words and the opportunity to ask your question. And now I would like to introduce our first speaker today, who is Keith Osley, a professor, an emeritus professor of cognitive psychology at the University of Toronto and also an award winning novelist. Professor Oatley researches, uh, focuses on psychology of emotion as well as cognitive psychology and literary fiction. He has developed the theory that fiction is a form of simulation that runs our minds. And over the past six years, his research theme investigated research respond, readers' responses to short stories and other literature. This research provided the first evidence that, as compared with reading non-fiction, reading fiction is associated with improved empathy and theory of mind, and that literary fiction enables small but possibly important changes in the reader's personalities. So, Professor Hodley, thank you very much for accepting uh, our invitation, and please feel free to share your screen, and we look forward to your talk. Okay. Well, thank you so much, um, Marina and Nicole, for inviting me. So, this is, I love these conversations. It's it's very good to do this, um, even although it is a bit online. <laughs> okay, and I'm I'm going to give um, talk for you know a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to show a slideshow, and then if that doesn't work, then you, you'll help me, Marina. Right? <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, so. Um, although in philosophy, okay, here's my talk. <laughs> um, so, although in philosophy, interest in fiction goes back as far as Aristotle's Poetics, it, until recently, fiction was of absolutely no interest in psychology, where it was thought of as a kind of description by a commentator. Uh, without two ingredients that are thought essential in psychology. One is uh, validity. Is this real <laughs> um, and observable? And the other is re reliability. Can it be replicated? And since it's clear that fiction is totally hopeless in both regards, it was of absolutely no interest in psychology. <laughs> This, however, has changed um, and it sort of it began in the last century. Maybe uh, it started in Russia with the formalists um, who showed how certain kinds of fiction could enable one to see a situation that was familiar, but in a surprising way, as if for the first time. And then also early in the last century, I.A. Richards did a, a kind of experiment in which he had students write whatever came to mind about a set of poems in a, um, in a um, literary class that he was teaching. And then he was followed by Louise Rosenblatt, who proposed that fiction is a kind of what she called mental exploration and transaction between a reader with the writer or literary character. And then uh, one of the first psychologists was D.W. Harding with a theory of emotions in Jane Austen's um, uh, novels. So what I think was a very important uh, proposal was made by Jerome Bruner in his book of 1986 called Actual Minds, Possible Worlds. It was that humans have two distinct modes of thought. One he called narrative, which concerns human intentions and the vicissitudes that they meet. Quite a good word, vicissitudes, right? <laughs> The other he called paradigmatic, which are explanations of the physical world. 
And you might have thought that psychologists would be totally interested in the first of these, but they weren't. <laughs> They're much more interested in mechanisms um, and uh, brain mechanisms and um, uh, behavioral outcomes. So I've got a little slideshow now, which I'm going to try and put on. OK, uh, so I've got to do some stuff here. OK, and now I do that. Is that it? Yeah, we can see your screen. OK, and now I'm going to do this. Is, Fantastic, can we can see your presentation full screen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, um, how am I doing for time? Am I OK? So, uh, so I've got an, about another 15 minutes. Is that right? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Is that OK? OK, yes, definitely. right, here we go. So the most works of literary art are fiction. And although various people have talked about how um, poetry or fiction instructs, or Shelley said legislate, or tries to persuade, it has a message. What we think is that it doesn't do any of those things. It's an invitation for people to reflect and to think for themselves. And so fiction isn't description. You know, if you're an architect, you have to have a description of what a building is going to be like. And it isn't that. It's suggestion and it's simulation. And it isn't something that's just been made up. You know, in English, they say, well, you know, fiction is just made up. But it doesn't, it isn't that. It's, it's about things that we know that are put together in um, new configurations. Um, so, and we call, talk about those as simulations. Um, so although that word is modern, um, Shakespeare had this same idea and he called it dream. And what he meant by that is a play in the theater is a model of the social world and with this idea he wrote a midsummer night's dream and once he'd had that idea he couldn't stop talking about it so at the beginning of henry v he wrote uh, you know someone comes on and uh, introducing the play and says think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth, for it is your thoughts that now must deck our kings. And so by suggestion, I think the fiction writer's share is maybe one third, but it's the reader or audience member who provides the largest amount, maybe two thirds. So simulations help us understand complexes, and we're quite good as human beings at understanding one process at a time. So if we think of the weather, I say if there's a mass of cold air meets a mass of warm air, then the co cold air cools down the warm air and any um, water that's dissolved in the warm air um, precipitates and forms rain or snow or hail. And we can understand that. But if we then add in whether there are mountains or seas and what the winds are like and the barometric pressure and lots of other variables, then we're not so good at thinking about these complexes. And so uh, we have a simulation. And so here from uh, last weekend's New York Times um, last Sunday, here is a map which is based on a simulation um, and it's got all what's likely to happen that day and the next day and then uh, at the bottom there are um, predictions of temperature trends in lots of cities and fiction is similar so we can understand a single process for, for instance if Alison is angry with Beth she may say something hurtful to her but what if Beth is Alison's three-year-old daughter? Or what if Alison and Beth are both adults who've just started a sexual relationship 
after Alison is still upset from a recent breakup from someone else? Or what if Alison and Beth are married and they go out one evening with their friend Colin, with whom it's very important for Alison to maintain the very best opinion? And so just as with simulations of weather, um, of the weather, um, what fiction does is to put together things that we know into new complexes. So art, here is one of the earliest um, pieces of cave art in, from France, uh, Chauvet, uh, from 31,000 years ago. And as you can see, it's a rhinoceros. And art only arrived in uh, human evolution rather recently. And art, something is both what it is and what it's not. And so Stephen Mithen proposed it's a metaphor. A cave painting is a set of marks on a rock, a rhinoceros. A burial mound implies a funeral, which stories are told of a person who is dead, but alive in memory or on another plane. So I'm going to talk now about um, a few experiments that we did. Um, so the first one um, we had, um, we measured the amount of fiction and non-fiction that people read. And then we had two outcome measures. The most famous one is this by Sam, Simon Baron Cohen. And there's 36 of these pictures. And the person has to say what this, uh, the participant has to say what this person is feeling. Is she joking? Is she flustered? Is she showing desire? Is she convinced? And if you meet someone at a party who looks at you like this and you think she's joking, you may be missing something. <laughs> so, so the term here is desire. So um, what we found is that people who read a lot of fiction are much better at this mind in the eyes task, which I've just given you um, one example of. And people who read mainly nonfiction are not so good at that. And then Raymond did this rather good um, study in which he looked at bits of the uh, everybody, all everything published in which bits of the brain um, were activated by um, uh, uh, people either doing a theory of mind task or uh, comprehension of a story. And these yellow bits here are uh, where there's an overlap. So comprehending a story in these places overlaps with people's understanding of other minds. So empathy, we found that um, people who read more fiction are more empathetic uh, with other people. And um, what we do is within a fictional simulation, we can identify with a protagonist by putting aside our own concerns, a bit like if you're doing meditation, and we take on the concerns of a character in the situation that's depicted. And the emotions we feel there are not those of the character, they're our own emotions in the circumstances that that character is in. And then in a second set of studies, Maya Jikic and I, uh, with some other colleagues, assigned people to read either Anton Chekhov's most famous short story, The Lady with the Little Dog, or a control text. And what we found was that people who read Chekhov's story were able to ch or did change their personality by small amounts. And here's another little slide here. Um, um, a, um, um, uh, um, a picture of that. So people in the condition that's called art were the people who read uh, Chekhov's story. And what we found so interesting about that is rather than persuasion, where everybody changes in the way that the author wants them to, in this study, we found that people 
everybody changed in their own way. And so some people became, um, you know, a bit more outgoing or other people became a bit more friendly and so on. So everybody changed in their own way. And we think this is very important for literary art. Um, OK, so um, I'm just uh, got two more slides now. And um, so uh, Marcel Proust, I think of as one of uh, the last century's most important psychologists, although people think of him as a novelist, but a psychologist as well. And he wrote this. However deeply we sympathize, a real human being is perceived mainly by our senses. This means that the person remains opaque to us and offers a dead weight that our perceptions cannot lift. If a misfortune should strike this person, it is only in a small part of the total understanding that we have that we can be moved by this. The discovery of the novelist is the idea of replacing those parts that are impenetrable to the mind by an equal quantity of immaterial parts. That's to say parts that our minds can assimilate and within an hour set free states of happiness and unhappiness of kinds that would take years of our ordinary life coming to know. And so here on the left is um, a sample of Proust's writing. And as you can see, it isn't a matter of having something in your mind and just putting it into paper. What you have used the paper as an extension of your mind to do thinking. And what he says here <clears throat> in this last part is it would be even being inexact to say that I thought of those who read it as readers of my book because they were not, as I saw it, my readers. More exactly, they were readers of themselves, my book being a sort of magnifying glass by which I could give them the means to read within themselves. So there we are. Fun. OK, now I've got to somehow um, uh, move away from this. Um, OK, what, what do I have to do now, Marina? Um, so you go back to our faces on Teams. I do. Uh, uh -huh. That there. Exactly. And then you press the small cross. Oh. The cross. OK, mm -hmm. there we go. Is, is that OK? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, that was... Okay. <laughs> it makes you very anxious doing these things. But there that we went are. perfect. Thank you very <laughs> much. It was very interesting. And we'll come back, we'll return to your presentation during the discussion. Okay. And now um, we have our second speaker, is Jerome Pelletier, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the Institut Jean Nicot, Ecole Normale Supérieure at Un and University of Brest. Professor Pelletier is a philosopher of language who first worked on the semantics of fictional discourse. He then has addressed the more general issue of our experience of fictional content from the perspectives of the philosophy of mind and analytical aesthetics. He has recently conducted two projects funded by the French National Agency for Research with cognitive scientists to investigate our interactions with fictional works and artifacts such as paintings and um, or fixed photographic images. Professor Pelletier currently investigates the relation of fiction to action. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and we look forward for your talk. Thank you. I see you are still muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Um, great. Um, we can see your presentation now. Yes. Do you want to make it full screen? I will. I am. I am. Mm -hmm. I am. Yes. Fantastic. You are. Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. So, so the title of of uh, my presentation. So you'll see it. So, uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, it says quasi emotion in responses to fiction. Question mark. So. Uh, uh, 
a philosophical theory and a psychological study. So uh, I, I, I'm trying to to uh, to present um, um, to confront to confront uh, a, a philosophical theory on crazy emotion and a psychological study, uh, which has something to do with crazy emotions. The confrontation of philosophy and psychology on affective states. So I, I limit myself in this presentation to affective states uh, because uh, so in, in the in announcement of the seminar, uh, Nicole and uh, Marina, you wrote uh, it's not yet clear whether cognitive and affective engagement with fiction is different from engagement with real life events. OK, so. Actually, I disagree a little bit with this uh, presentation, uh, 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 at least in philosophy. Uh, I, I believe uh, uh, th th there is a, a kind of consensus in philosophy uh, uh, concerning a cognitive engagement with, with, with the difference between a cognitive engagement with fiction and out of fiction. Uh, uh, most philosophers and seem to endorse the view that uh, cognitive engagement with uh, real life events uh, are based or is based on belief states, uh, whereas uh, cognitive engagement with fiction are not, for, for the most part, based on belief states. Uh, they, they, they are said by philosophers to be based on uh, imagination states. So I think there is a kind of consensus on, on, the, on the nature of the cognitive engagement uh, and the difference uh, between our cognitive engagement with fiction, in fiction and out of fiction. Whereas, uh, and I think that, so your, your, your announcement was very uh, relevant concerning affective engagement with fiction, uh, which in philosophy, uh, 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 it's, it's not at all clear how to understand uh, our infective, affective engagement with fiction and, and its likely difference with our affective engagement with real life. Uh, so there is a, a wide variety of opinions in philosophy on our affective engagement. And so uh, in this presentation, so I, I will limit myself to the, the, the question of our affective engagement with fiction and real events. Uh, and I will limit myself also to, to one philosophical view, which is uh, Ken Walton's quasi-emotion theory. Um, and to one psychological study, actually, which is the one I co-conducted -con -con on this question, on the question of the difference between affective states in response to real events and to fictional events. So it is uh, the, the, the two, 2016 uh, a study uh, which has been published by uh, Spare Duty and colleagues, including me. Um, so, uh, wh wh why do I confront this philosophical theory on quasi emotion and this psychological study? Because there are two defenses of what I call the difference view or the different thesis, which is a thesis that there is a difference between affective engagement in and out of fiction. But there are two different ways of, of defending this defending the, the philosophical way and uh, a psychological way. Um, but in the end, uh, only the philosophical theory claims that uh, we are entitled to, to endorse the view that we are talking here of two kinds of emotion states, uh, quasi emotion in fiction and emotion out of fiction. Uh, so only the philosophical theory claims that we could classify in two different categories uh, affective states in response to fiction and to real events. This is not the case of the psychological theory. Okay. So, so we, 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 we have here two pers perspectives on what I call the difference view concerning our affective engagement in and out of fiction. The philosophical perspective of Ken Walton, um, which says that 
there is a, what we can call a constitutive difference between two kinds of emotion, between quasi emotion and emotion. Um, in, in, in a way, uh, quasi emotion, that is affective states in response to fiction, are not made of the same stuff, are not constituted in the same way uh, as affective states, which are called emotion, uh, in response to non-fiction. Uh, so it's a constitutive thesis uh, Walton is defending. Uh, whereas uh, the psychological perspective uh, is, is different. Uh, it, it, it supports uh, 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 so, uh, a different view. Uh, uh, that is, uh, it registers an important difference between emotions in and out of fiction without supporting the constitutive philosophical thesis on two kinds of emotion. Um, so would this comparison between these two approaches matter for Walton's philosophical theory? So that's the question uh, I'm asking in this presentation. And so let's see. So uh, let's start with the philosophical uh, theory of Ken Walton on quasi-emotion. So uh, Ken Walton is uh, imagining so uh, a cinema viewer, he calls Charles, and uh, he's, Charles is watching a, a sci-fi movie uh, uh, with a green slime. And um, so a, a fearful, uh, frightening green slime. And so when uh, Charles uh, is seeing the, the, the green slime on the screen facing, uh, somehow facing him, uh, uh, Walton claims that Charles uh, quasi fears the slime, which is counterintuitive. We, 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 we are uh, supposed to think that Charles fears the slime, just not quasi fears the slime. So what does Walton mean? mean by this? Uh, the idea of Walton is that, is that uh, Charles' feelings are not based on beliefs, uh, because Charles does not believe the slime is dangerous. So Charles imagines, he does not believe, he, he imagines that the, the slime is dangerous, and uh, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the new uh, uh, idea of, of Ken Walton. Uh, it, uh, Charles also imagines of his feelings that there are feelings of fear. Um, and for, for that reason, uh, Charles' feelings are, of fear are said to be states of quasi-fear, because, so in, in Ken Walton's uh, lexical, uh, th they are being taken into a game of, of imagination that Ken Walton described as, as a game of make-believe. Uh, uh, they are being taken, his own feelings, he takes his own feelings into a game of make-believe. Uh, Charles plays a game of make-believe with the images on screen, so a perceptual game of, of make-believe, and he also plays an affective game of make-believe with his own feelings while watching the movie. Uh, uh, in the end, uh, Clay, uh, Walton uh, claims that Charles does not experience feelings of fear, but quasi-fear feelings. So feelings of fear uh, are not the, the kind of affective states that Charles is experiencing. Uh, he's not, he's just experiencing quasi-fear feelings uh, of which it is true that uh, fictionally there are feelings of fear, uh, that make believably there are feelings of fear. So this is part uh, the quasi-emotion theory of Ken Walton is part of a large uh, and very uh, impressive philosophical theory about the, what he calls the generation of make-believe truth by uh, representational works of art. Um, but the, the things to, 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 to understand that for Walton, there is a kind of conceptual connection between quasi-emotional states and uh, the appropriate cognitive attitudes to fiction. Quasi-emotion is what should be felt in our rational interactions with fiction. Um, uh, so it's really a constitutive thesis uh, about the nature of quasi-emotion. 
about, about the nature of affective states. And for that uh, philosophical claim, uh, Walton does not bring in any empirical support, but he does not need to bring any empirical support because it is a philosophical conceptual claim he is defending in his quasi-emotion theory. Now let's go to, to the psychological study of 2016. So in this study, so we tried to test uh, experimentally whether there are differences between uh, affective states in fiction and out of fiction. Um, we, we use stimuli that were visual clips. So on, on, on the, these aspects, they are very close to, to Walton's uh, example, which is a cinematic visual example of green slime on the screen. Um, but uh, they are very different uh, from uh, a movie because they were very short. Uh, they, they lasted uh, four or five seconds. Uh, and so these clips, and there was silence. Uh, uh, these clips were presented uh, to subjects in two conditions, either as recordings of real scenes or as recordings of fictional scenes. So uh, they were introduced, they were primed by uh, a word cue as a fiction or real, so which indicated the, the nature of the scenes depicted by the clip whether it was a record, recording of real events or uh, uh, a depiction of fictional events. Uh, one has to note that these clips were deprived of all artistic qualities. There were no recognizable actors, there were no camera movements, there were no editing, there were no lighting and close-ups and so on. Uh, there was there were not any signposts of fictionality or uh, of cinematographical innovations in these clips. Here is, you find an image of a negative emotion uh, clip, a negative scene, uh, which was pre presented as a clip, as a video clip, so uh, either in the real condition or in the fictional condition. Uh, so for instance, a fight uh, between two persons. Uh, that was kind of uh, clips that were presented for positive uh, scenes. And we also presented neutral scenes uh, we, we, without any emotional in intensity like this one. And uh, so th this is the protocol of the study. Uh, so the word cue as a real or fictional, then the clip. Uh, 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 and then we, we, we break and we did it again and again and again. And uh, we did it twice because the first time we, pre we, we, we measured uh, uh, the skin conductance of the subject while they were watching uh, the, the clip. Uh, so the EDA, the electrodermal activity. And, uh, and the, the second time we asked them to, to, to weight the intensity of the emotion uh, they felt. Uh, so it's a subjective uh, measure. Uh, we, we ask first a physiological measure, EDA, and then a subjective measure of affective intensity. So uh, what is our main result? Uh, it concerns mainly uh, negative emotions. Uh, we found that, uh, so, in the fiction condition, when the clips were presented as fictional, uh, negative emotions were physiologically nearly identical to emotions and uh, to, to clips presented in the real condition. But, but uh, very significantly, uh, they had uh, attenuated subjective feelings uh, relative to emotional response in real condition. So that was mainly the case for negative emotions. For positive emotion, it was less clear, even if it goes in the same direction. But the, 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 the difference between the two kinds of experience uh, were not uh, as strong, as robust as it was with uh, negative scenes. But it, 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 it goes in the same direction with positive 
feelings also and positive emotions. Uh, so that's the two diagram to understand the, uh, the main result. Uh, uh, so you see uh, the skin conductance, so the physiological measure is nearly the same uh, in the fiction and in the real condition. Uh, there, is, there is a difference. It's a bit low, lower in the fiction condition uh, than in the real condition, but it's not really different. Uh, it's not significantly different. Whereas the subjective experience intensity, so the, the, the way the subjects weight, rate the, 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 the way they feel uh, about the, 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 the clip, uh, uh, there is here a strong and robust difference in the two situations. And uh, there is an attenu attenuation, a strong attenuation uh, of the feeling uh, uh, of, the neg uh, of, ne of negative emotions uh, in the fiction condition uh, versus this feeling when the same clips, uh, the same ones, are presented in the real condition. Um, so what, what shall we do with this uh, study? Uh, so I think we, we could identify two things. Uh, first, uh, there is a kind of decoupling, uh, uh, which is which occurs only in the fiction condition, a decoupling between the physiological arousal impact of the negative emotions on one side and the phenomenological uh, impact of the negative emotion on this other side. This decoupling uh, uh, is not um, does not occur in the real condition. Uh, only in the fiction, fiction condition, we have this decoupling. As a, uh, uh, there is a divorce, if you want, uh, between the, the, the physiological arousal, uh, which remains very high, uh, and the phenomenological arousal, which is much lower uh, in the fiction condition, whereas in the real condition, both uh, are nearly at the same level. And on that basis, so we suggested that this uh, attenuation of subjective negative feelings in, in the fiction condition should be something like the outcome of a process that enables the viewer to control his or her negative subjective and emotional experience in the fiction situation, which does not happen in the real uh, condition. Uh, so, we, 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 we surmise that the, 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 this is a result of a process of, 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 of control uh, on the side of the viewer during the fiction condition. And we understand this control process as a process of emotional regulation or emotion regulation. Uh, there is, according to, to us, some kind of implicit emotion regulation which are, occurs, which take place, uh, and which uh, explain that there is a weaker subjective emotional response uh, to fiction uh, relatively to uh, non-fiction. Um, so let's go back to the quasi-emotion question. Uh, what can we say about uh, quasi-emotion on the basis of this study? So I think the, the first result is in somehow uh, our experimental results fit Walton's philosophical dissociation between uh, the physiological and the feeling impact on chance of fear in fiction. Uh, if you read the, the 1978 paper of uh, Ken Walton, Fearing Fiction, in which he introduces the quasi-emotion theory, um, in a footnote, uh, just a footnote, but it is here. He says that the, the, the purely physiological aspects of quasi-fear uh, are not part of what makes it make believe that he is afraid. So he, he, for Walton, uh, only the feelings of Charles are said to be modified by the fictionality of the moving sense he is watching, uh, not the physiological aspect. Uh, he, 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 um, uh, of his condition wh while he watches the, the movie. Uh, and this is very um, 
somehow uh, uh, Walton anticipated our results on this. Uh, and there is an agreement uh, between both approaches on this question uh, somehow. Um, but beyond this agreement, uh, there is much disagreement, I believe, between uh, both uh, approaches, uh, because are we entitled on, 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 on uh, that basis to, to call so what we discovered as regulated emotions in fiction, are we entitled to call them quasi-emotions? Uh, so the question, I think, is, is, is uh, a question for a cognitive philosopher, what I call a cognitive philosopher. Uh, what, uh, and so my question is, what should a cognitive philosopher say about this? So let, let's call a cognitive philosopher uh, a philosopher, not a psychologist, so a philosopher who is looking for experimental results in order to help him or her to, uh, to find a way to approach a philosophical issue. Um, in that case, so the, the, the philosophical issue of the nature of our emotional responses to fiction and of the question of the difference between uh, emotional responses to fiction and to non-fiction. I believe a cognitive philosopher would find in uh, our experimental study as a, a different way from Walton's of bringing uh, the quasi vocabulary into the discussion, a way where quasi would mean regulated, uh, quasi emotion are regulated emotion, according to our study, uh, or he, he or she will find in our experimental study a reason of not bringing at all the quasi vocabulary into the discussion. Because after all, regulated emotions are bona fide emotions, as they are not uh, emotions of a different kind. They are just emotions, but regulated emotions. So whatever way this cognitive philosopher chooses, he or she could not vindicate Walton's constitutive claim on quasi-emotions. And it is not surprising that uh, this has to be told, uh, to, to be said. Uh, then, could, could this cognitive philosopher refute Walton's claim on quasi-emotion? Certainly not. Uh, why? Because the, the experimental data of, of our study are not relevant for Walton's philosophical constitutive claim on quasi-emotion, you know, on the connection between emotion and imagination. The idea is that emotion to fiction are based on imagining states or make-believe states. So, if we leave aside the, 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 the confirmation our experiment brings to uh, uh, what Walton seemed to have anticipated concerning the dissociation between the physiological arousal uh, and the feeling of Charles, uh, letting aside this, uh, we could conclude that the experimental data uh, have no real philosophical importance for uh, Walton's theory. Still, we could do the, uh, a recap. So, uh, according to our experimental study, uh, all indicators testify the occurrence of true negative feelings in response to fiction. Uh, these are not uh, fake negative feelings. We, we, we don't have uh, any, any uh, 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 data in the, uh, going into that di di direction at all. Um, these two negative feelings so are in a systematic way down regulated relative to non fiction. Um, so the cognitive philosopher could uh, label these uh, emotions in fiction as quasi-emotions, but in a non-Waltonian sense, uh, because emotions in response to fiction are artifacts of regulat regulatory processes. They are not artifacts of, of make-believe when placed with the props and with oneself. Are, but still, they could be and this could be 
compatible with our experimental results, there certainly could be, at a constitutive level, artifacts of game of make believe when plays with the props and with oneself. So the thing we agree entirely with Walton, and this is not um, nothing, uh, this is important. I think that the, the real cases and the fictional cases differ at the phenomenological level. And this is something we agree uh, uh, with uh, Walton's uh, philosophical theory. Uh, thank you. That's it for me. Thank you very much. So. So am I back with you? Yes. yes. OK. Um, great, thank you very much. Now we can begin the discussion. Um, we usually start the discussion asking our speakers to comment on each other talk uh, or maybe ask a question. So Keith, would you like to begin? OK, well, um, thank you very much, Jerome. I find your experiment very interesting. Um, May I first uh, say a couple of words about Walton, who's made his career out of exactly uh, this issue. And what Walton starts to do is, as you explained, he has this idea of this man called Charles in a cinema watching a movie about green slime. And what impresses Walton is why Charles doesn't feel fear, so he runs out of the cinema. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people have been impressed by that, um, I don't know what it is, idea. Now, I've had discussions with Walton about this. Um, I think that what he does is to start off by trying to be dismissive of fiction. So quasi is a dismissive idea, and you said it, Jerome. Uh, I heard you mention the word fake. <laughs> so, you know, there's one dismissive claim. Um, and so quasi, you know, fake. And then um, another one is make believe. Again, dismissive. And so rather than thinking about what's really going on in our engagement with fiction, Walton just wants to sort of say, you know, like that. Now, I find it very interesting that you, Jerome, as a philosopher and a psychologist, then think, well, OK, now what could the evidence be? And Walton has absolutely, so far as I can tell, zero interest in evidence. So um, what he does is think in terms of what we might call logic. If this is the case, if Charles doesn't run out of the cinema, then such and such. Now, as it happens, as a psychologist, I can sort of look into the screen and say to you, the brain, the mind doesn't work by logic. Just as it doesn't work by differential equations or quantum theory. The brain works by making models of the world and projecting them onto the world in order to understand it. And so it seems to me that Walton is going off in a direction that doesn't have all that much to do with the way that the mind works. So there's my question to you, Jerome. Um, there's a logical problem, but it really, you know, and I think what you've done in your experiment with these two other people is to say, all right, now, how can we think of evidence? And um, 
I think that for me, that's a better way to go. And I find your study very interesting. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, so no, I, I uh, thank you very much. I, I wish to to defend a, b a little bit Ken Walton uh, against your, uh, <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your against you. You just said because uh, he is he, not um, he's a he's a, he's a philosopher uh, interested in constructing a philosophical theory uh, and. Uh, is as you said is he, he does not uh, is not interested in evidence for uh, the philosophical theory uh, but uh, he, he, he uses thought experiments sometimes you see thought experiments in order to to, to test uh, our intuitions on um, our the connection between our concepts and so on. So he, he has somehow a, a, a philosophical way of finding some evidence, uh, which is very different from an empirical way of finding evidence in psychology and in other empirical studies. Uh, so we could not um, object to Walton that he is not interested in the mind because he, he is very much interested in philosophy of mind. You see, <laughs> he, 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 he is interested in, in philosophies of mind, in, in philosophy of, of art, uh, in philosophy of fiction. And uh, so he constructs a philosophical theory and the quasi emotion theory part of it is just a part of this large, wide, impressive philosophical theory. And it works uh, very well. It's very coherent in uh, as a philosophical theory. And it, 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 I think it, it brings a lot to the philosophical discussion. And also, uh, it can lead some philosophers like me to try to find, to see whether there is a cognitive basis or, 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 or uh, about this, uh, if, there, if there is or not, or there is not a cognitive basis. And actually, uh, we found some cognitive basis of this distinction he, he mentioned in a footnote between a physiological uh, impact of emotion and uh, the feeling of emotion in fiction. Uh, there is a dissociation, and, he, and we, we found some evidence for that. Uh, it, 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 Walton did did not need this evidence in order to 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 to, to defend this philosophical claim, but we we, we brought him something somehow. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to to, to understand the, the the articulation between uh, philosophy and psychology, and uh, to see how it 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 could somehow interact, uh, which is my. Ideas. There is a possible interaction. As you said, you are completely right. Walton is not interested in this interaction at all. You, 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 are, you are completely <laughs> right. <laughs> but but he, 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 he created such, a, he constructed such a magnificent philosophical theory that he, he didn't need this, this interaction. Probably this, an interaction would have prevented him to, to build such a philosophical uh, impressive theory. So uh, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm very much a Waltonian uh, uh, on, on some aspects of uh, philosophy of fiction, but I'm also very much interested in, uh, in, in the connection with uh, psych uh, cognitive psychology uh, between philosophy and cognitive psychology. This is why I, 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 uh, uh, I am a bit unusual in, 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 this, uh, in this way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but you are right about Walton, but he, he, he is right, I think, uh, <laughs> from his own perspective to, to, to have done how he has, he has developed his theory. Thank you. So maybe we are now ready to discuss some. Um, if you have any questions, the audience, please write them in the chat or raise your hand. Meanwhile, I have a question to both of you, but first maybe to Keith. Now, when you describe these experiments on how fiction affects theory of mind, they are very impressive and they were replicated many times 
um, with cinema and with lit literary fiction as well. So my question, now I we now all agree that fiction has this effect on theory of mind. My question is, what do you think about the mechanism which underlies that effect? Because the mechanism is less clear. It's also very impressive that reading Chekhov's story, reading his reasoning about the feelings of the woman and reasoning about them ourselves helps us to understand emotions when we look at the eyes. Because when we understand emotions looking at other people's facial expressions, that's kind of perceptive theory of mind. And it is relatively, relatively distinct from reasoning about other people's minds. So they kind of even have a bit different neural correlates. And it's very impressive that only reading fiction even has an effect on how we understand emotions when we look at other people. So I'm just wondering what can be, what can explain that? Because in Jerome's talk about his experimental study, if I'm not mistaken, Jerome did not use actual fiction. He didn't use actual cinema. He used YouTube videos, which basically were made by ordinary people and presented them as fiction. But in your experiments, you actually used real fiction. So that's also interesting. The mechanism which underlies the facts of fiction, it yeah. can be related to the context, my knowledge that something is not real, like in Jerome's experiment, or it can be related to the fiction itself, to what the artist is doing with the artwork that then helps us, say, understand emotions better. So can you maybe say something about that? that what, what's the mechanism? What can be the mechanism? Yeah. Be no, no, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, and I think one of the things that I find very interesting about art um, is Collingwood's idea that what an artist does is to translate her or his emotions into what he calls a language. And that language is either a language of words or of visual images or music. And by translating an inner emotion into this externalized language, we can then pass it over to someone else. Um, and I find that a very interesting theory by a philosopher. <laughs> and historian um, and so your question is all right now what's the mechanism of that so here's a proposal um, what we human beings can do as I'm now looking out I can see you know I'm looking north, north uh, in Toronto I can see buildings I can see cranes and so on and I can have thoughts about these buildings. And what Andy Clark said is that one of the evolutionary moves that we humans have made is the ability to have thoughts about thoughts. And in fiction, what we are presented with, either in these translations of words or visual images or, or music or sometimes all three together is a way of enabling us to have thoughts about these ideas that wouldn't otherwise have occurred to us and so although there is some difference between movies and uh, reading. Uh, Melanie Green, who lives you know, not too far away from where we are in Toronto, in Buffalo, has shown that these differences between movies and, and uh, novels are really relatively small. I mean, there are some differences, but the inner Essence, well, essence isn't quite right. The inner meaning of them is a kind of invitation to say, all right, now you readers or audience members or viewers, what do you think and feel about this? 
And so it's a kind of extension of our ability not just to see and perceive, but to think about other people and what their relation is to us and what would we do in that kind of situation. So I think it's that I, that's the kind of direction I think I would go in. D does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. It's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that question about mechanism is always very complicated, not an easy one. Thank you. Good. Sh sh shall I ask a question? Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I, 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 I'm afraid you 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 go too um too wide in your explanation i mean you 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 bring uh, art narrative and fiction together and uh, i i think fiction is a special case mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um Maybe not. If it is not a special case, if fiction is not a special case, one has to defend this claim. I know. OK, and so that's my question. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, all narratives are not fictional narratives. Of course, no, and, uh, and all art is not a fiction art about depicting fictional situations. Uh, so uh, w that's a difficulty I have with your approach. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, in, in your talk, I mean, not in your papers, but in in your talk. Now, you see, you, you bring in art and narratives uh, at the same time as fiction, and so that's just uh, yes, little yes. difficulty I have. Well, that is the direction I think I, as a psychologist, that I want to go in. Um, to ask, and this is what you were asking, Marina, what is really at the heart of this? And so that's why I uh, showed you that picture of um, a rhinoceros, an early piece of cave art. So what is going on here? Um, and I think the idea that art is a kind of metaphor, this is something which is a not something. And what we're doing there is to invite people to make an association that they might not otherwise have made. And so rather than merely just looking out at the world in the way that um, Proust was arguing, what fiction and other kinds of art do um, is to translate something that we might not have thought about into a way that we can think about it. So that is, and it may be a bit too wide, but it seems to me um, that that is the centre of what art is all about. Um, and as I said, I, I find art so important because it's so utterly different from, for instance, what advertisers are doing or what politicians are doing or what propagandists are doing. And they're saying, this is what you should think. This is how you should act. Now go out and buy this. And art is something more like an invitation and, you know, I talked about, and you talked about imagination. And what do we think? And so here we are having this very interesting discussion. And without art, we wouldn't be having it. <laughs> can, 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 I, can I reply to, sure. uh, with, with another question to Keith? Uh, so in your according to you uh, art has something to do with uh, meta representation yeah huh? okay. and and so how come 
Uh, at the same time, you, we, we, you refer to Simon Baron Cohen in, in, yes. your, in your presentation. And so he, he studied autistic mm -hmm. uh, persons. And uh, do you think uh, autistic persons have no um, interest in art? <laughs> uh, if, if, if art is, is, is I mean, uh, triggers metacognitive, uh, uh, if it's if, if, if by nature uh, metacognitive, and if autistic uh, persons have difficulties in metacognition, uh, so yeah. that, that, that's that's a question. Okay. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, what Simon Baron Cohen uh, did is to create this mind in the eyes task. And then he looked to see um, whether women and men are different on that. And so when it comes to fiction, women read more fiction than men. And women are rather better at understanding human interactions than men. And often what men need to do in order to have a conversation is they need to talk about something other than what's going on between them. So they talk about football or something. Right? And then they can have a relationship. But I think what fiction enables us to do is to move towards understanding each other. And I think that's the center of it um, for me. So maybe we should sort of ask other people to join in. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a question from Eric. Eric, can you please ask your question? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the really interesting talks. I very much enjoyed it. So my, I have two questions, actually. Uh, my first one, um, has to do with how you both conceive of imagination. And I'm wondering if that might have something to do with the difference in opinion um, that's being expressed here. Um, so forgive me if I misrepresent your positions, but on the Waltonian stance, imagination is an alternative to a belief state. So, and um, to imagine is to engage in fiction. Whereas uh, I think Professor Oatley is, is giving a different view in which imagination is simulation. It's when we have models of the world in our minds that we project onto the world, whether it's, it's fictional or non-fictional. Um, so that's my first question, if that can be resolved by just looking at how we think of imagination. The second one, has to do with the picture that um, Professor Oatley showed earlier on of the eyes. And I'm wondering, I'm, and I'm asking you both this, if when we try to discern what emotion that person is feeling, if that isn't imagination always, even if it's not fictional, because we can't see another person's mental state. Um, and to take that one step further, I guess, let's say I see the person in real life, okay, and I see their eyes, I imagine their mental state, um, or believe what their mental state is, but I don't, I don't think belief quite works there. Um, but I imagine their mental state, and then I have an emotional response to what I imagine their mental state to be. Would that be a quasi emotion or a real emotion if it's based on kind of a make believe? Um, so those are my two questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you want to go first, Jerome, or shall I? I think it's for, it's for, it's for you to start. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so look, um, imagination, you know, is one of these wonderful human abilities. And if you look in developmental psychology, you can see children beginning to have these imaginative states and maybe a very important study by Judy Deloche 
was when she had children uh, look at a model of a doll's house in a room with little bits of furniture. And then she um, had a little doll or something and then hid the doll behind a chair in this doll's house. And then in her laboratory, she had a room set up exactly like this doll's house. And she asked the children to go and find that little doll. And children who were two and a half years old couldn't do it. But by the age of three, they could understand that the doll's house was a model of this room and they could immediately go and find it. And so and, and I've written a paper about this. So it seems to me there are about six. Um, developmental events of this kind, and, and this is one of them, that enable us to see how imagination starts. OK, so that was your first question. And then the other one, the mind in the eyes task and autism. Um, yeah, um, I mean, we use this this measure, um, you know, because uh, it isn't verbal. And so reading fiction, if you just had uh, someone saying, all right, what was the meaning of that story? So if we had this visual thing, then our argument was that that must be something that connects uh, in in uh, within the mind, something like that. OK, so uh, uh, sorry, I haven't answered your questions fully, but that's those are the directions I'm going in. Thank you, Eric, for your very interesting questions, uh, because uh, I, I think you pointed to something uh, very important, uh, which is um, Imagine as such, I mean, to, to bring in the, the philosophical discussion, uh, imagination as a criterion uh, of fiction uh, is very problematic uh, as, as a criterion of fictional engagement. Because as you said, uh, it seems as if uh, imagination is involved in, uh, for instance, in a simulation in the way uh, um, Keith understands simulation. And when you uh, understand simulation as mod modeling, uh, uh, it, 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 it aims most often uh, to real events and real situations. Uh, and so it's, 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 you, you, if one wants to uh, bring in imagination as a um, test for the fiction non-fiction distinction uh, it's very difficult and I'm, I, I, um, uh, and so you are, I have no definite answer on this uh, except that I agree with you uh, that imagination is involved involved sometimes in perception uh, and uh, uh, and perception of of of, of real situations uh, and so uh, but the second point concerns uh, the distinction between imagination and belief the second part of your question uh, and um, um, I'm more confident on this than you seem to be confident. Uh, uh, um, I think we, we 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 could have an understanding of what imagination is in relation to belief uh, 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 as uh, a, a kind of belief like state, uh, which is not a belief, uh, but which uh, somehow replicate belief uh, without connecting uh, its content uh, to, uh, for instance, to action. Uh, 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 and so we, 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 we I, I'm not as skeptical as you uh, concerning the, the imagination belief distinction. Uh, 
but still, uh, I, I, I believe imagination cannot solve the fiction, non-fiction distinction problem. Thank you. I don't know, Eric, if you wanted to, to respond uh, to um, to this. No, that was that was good. Thank you for your explanations. I appreciate it. Um, well, I guess I um, I have a question, but it's more it's more of a comment than a question. And with the thing that I struggle the most uh, when we talk about fiction and reality is that what is usually referred as reality is in itself a representation of an event. Uh, so uh, that in itself uh, could, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about you know, journalism or a video on YouTube, uh, that is, of course, representing the, the the event that happened in what we called reality, what we call the real world. So I guess I, I would really like to have your thoughts about this and uh, how, um, yeah, how to study this. I think this is a, a great limitation when we want to study uh, what we, we define as reality and fiction. Um, then yeah, uh, yeah, I, I would like to have your thoughts about this, and perhaps I have a, a follow-up question. Okay. Who is? Are you? Are you replying? Uh, am I reply? Trying to reply? Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's it, it was for for both of you, uh, both from like a, um, a philosophical point of view, what do we mean by reality, and also from an experimental point of view, how we can study this. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you want to go first, Jerome? Okay, I will. I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nicole, uh, I, I, I don't see really the problem, uh, not about what, saying what, what's real, what, what, what's reality. That, that's not easy task, of course. But uh, when you, when you, you say that uh, representation of reality uh, could I mean, uh, the ubiquitousness of representations, of public representations of reality, for instance, in uh, in YouTube videos or, or um, yeah, I don't know other examples, you, uh, journalism, journalism. Uh, um, um, does uh, do, do not really create uh, difficulties for, for philosophers of fiction, because uh, uh, th th there is a clear distinction between uh, uh, the fact that um, uh, a video or a journalist uh, selects aspects of reality uh, in order to present these aspects to readers or to viewers. Uh, uh, the selection process is, 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 is of course necessary uh, in order to present something to somebody, uh, you select the information you, you present. It does not mean that this information is fictional at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does not create uh, real difficulty with this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just a selection process. Uh, we, 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 are, we have constraints, we have time constraints. We, we, we need to select in order to communicate. Uh, information on the real world, uh, and and this selection process uh, is is necessary, uh, uh, and does not mean that what we are talking about is fictional, and the way we talk about this is fictional, or the way we present this is fictional at all. So philosophers try to to to, to make progress on what is the difference between a presentation of a of a series of statements. Uh, as fictional and a series of statements as non-fictional. Uh, th that's not easy task, of course, but uh, the fact that uh, we always select aspects of reality in order to discuss reality or to, uh, mm -hmm. does not create by itself a problem, I think, for uh, the philosophical uh, discussion on the fiction, non-fiction distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, I, I, I think there is selection, yeah. Um, should I say something? If you would like to, otherwise uh, I'll have a follow-up question. No, no, I, 
There's a very interesting book by a historian called Lynn Hunt um, on uh, the idea of civil rights and this idea that as human beings we have civil rights is a very very modern idea so in you know in 1740 it didn't exist it had to be invented um, and it was the beginning of the movement against abolishing slavery and there were two processes that enabled that to occur one was the invention of, of newspapers and what you were saying about journalists uh, yeah, saying uh, sorry i live in this we're conducting a test of the fire alarm system. Mm. Please disregard. That's not been no worries. Attention. We have attention, please. This is custom fire. We're conducting a test of the fire alarm system. Please disregard the alarm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the other was fiction. So um, reading novels. I mean, what she argues is both reading novels and reading newspapers, they both contributed to understanding that other people in our world are in different situations than ours and then mentally being able to enter into those kind of situations. Um, I'm sorry, you know. They do this and wake us up in the middle of the night sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Just wait a few minutes. It will stop in a moment. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm going to mute my, um, how can I mute the thingy? Okay. Yeah, you. Yeah, you're mute, Kate, at the moment. Yeah, sorry for uh, that. There's, there's no problem for the for the interruption, but um, perhaps we'll wait a few seconds. I only have five minutes left. I just have a quick question to Jerome. Um, it's just I'm really curious. You have this project you're working on now about. Um, climate change and all that stuff and you have this idea that fiction can be used to make people actually do something for climate change i mean you have this idea that fiction has some advantages compared to reality um i was just curious what is the idea behind that project why do you think that fiction can be can play a specific role in maybe changing our behavior in real life thank you okay uh no actually the, the, the project was submitted and uh, nearly passed, <laughs> but failed. <laughs> so it went very far in the selection process, but failed in the end. So, uh, so it has been blocked uh, at this stage, and so it was not developed. But the idea was uh, partly based on uh, the experiment we co conducted uh, on emotion, on negative emotions uh, towards uh, climate change, for instance. And so actually it could work also for COVID, I think, for the, for the pandemic, for the negative emotions towards the pandemic. And um, actually, uh, uh, there has been a study on, uh, on viewers of horror movies, which were at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, which were more uh, resilient, which were said to be more resilient to the pandemic than uh, other participants um, and uh, probably uh, fiction can help uh, I mean the uh, the presentation of fictional scenes uh, of negative uh, fictional scenes uh, like horror <laughs> could uh, could help to deal with uh, negative emotions in reality uh, and so if it is the case but it, it needs to be uh, uh, Proved and tested uh, much more. Uh, if it were the case, uh, it could maybe help to uh, to, to to act 
uh, to act towards uh, climate change or, or uh, pandemics and so on and to to, to to act somehow in the in a better way i mean uh, uh, not to be paralyzed somehow you see the idea is that fiction can in uh, if it is true that uh, negative situations elicit less uh, negative emotions than uh, in fiction than in, in real context if this is really true if it's really the case uh, maybe it could help not to be panicked by uh, negative situations in reality to be uh, trained somehow to deal with one's negative emotions in fiction first yeah that was the uh, part of the idea part of the project thank you yeah i mean if fiction helps better understand emotions maybe it also helps better regulate emotions thank you very much yeah. nicole yeah and this yeah and this kind of uh yeah, I kind of a little bit addresses my um, my question about the difference between fiction and reality, and uh, I guess it's more of about our our understanding and our framing of certain uh, um, events. Because in in what we call fiction, uh, there are I'm thinking about performance of actors that they actually you know gained weight or went through a very important physical training and they did like a, a performance that is very physical, and then when the audience uh, sees that performance, I'm, I don't know I'm thinking of Leonardo DiCaprio and the Revenant or uh, certainly they on in Monster, they both kind of gained weight and went through a very uh, important physical performance. And knowing from uh, an audience point of view that these actors uh, kind of really went through these uh, changes physically and then went through a series of performance performances in there were no stuntsmen involved in the performance that is then portrayed, then again, it, it regulates differently the way people em em empathize and, emo and yeah, feel emotions uh, towards these characters. So uh, yeah, perhaps reality and fiction is is a way we construct is a, is another um, mental representation and kind of model of the world. Um, so yeah, it's just just a, a, a comment. It's not really a question, but um, that's perhaps my reading of of this. Um, I don't know if you would like to comment um, or. Uh, So it's, it's, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, let me just um, uh, get this book here. Um, so you see, if have you, do, do you know this book, Jerome? Inventing. I, 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 uh, no, no. Uh, oh, that would be very relevant to your idea about climate change. You see, because two hundred and fifty years ago. Nobody believed that, you know, this is a philosophical term, believed <laughs> that we had human rights. And it's been difficult now for people to believe that climate change is, um, is so important for, you know, the world. And so what Lynn Hunt is doing is she's saying, well, it's actually both of these things. And that it was both fiction and, you know, journalism that enabled people to understand that slavery isn't something that we humans should be doing. OK, so I just wanted to say that. And, and I think you'd enjoy this book. Thank you. Thank you for the advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, so, Nicole, uh, I'm not sure I, I, I got your your commentary uh, well uh, enough to to comment on your commentary, but uh, uh, is it is it the question of uh, identification with a fictional character? Because for philosophers, it's, that's an interesting. I mean, the impersonation of the actor of his or her fictional character. So you said it 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 modified the real condition. Of the of the of the actor, uh, and and you and then I, and then I I lost your comment. I think. 
I guess I wanted to say that even in fiction, we can have kind of a reality uh, condition. Um, so I, what I what I meant is that even when, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I was just wondering basically if framing something as fictional reality is just a way of uh, interpreting the the thing that we see on on screen and perhaps uh yeah uh this is uh um this is a question for uh i mean i i see i opened up uh, you know, most so. most fiction i mean most narratives most movies are hybrid cases they are mainly depiction of the real world uh, with uh some intruders you see some fictional characters and some fictional places uh, which are brought into the real world. So uh, fiction is it's a very difficult object also for that reason, because it's Hebrew, hybrid uh, by somehow by, by, by nature. Thank you very much for uh, for your reply, and thank you very much both for for your talk. Uh, we ran out a, bit, a little bit out, out of time, so I just would like to remind uh, that next week we'll have a multisensory perception and art seminar, and uh, I'm gonna stop the recording now. And uh, thank you very much, both. Thanks a lot.